Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome you all to the study that we have here this morning. We're continuing our study addressing Abimelech's conspiracy. And um, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have here to study your word, um, for the fellowship that we can experience, for the correction that we can receive as your Holy Spirit works upon each heart and guides each mind. Um, we pray, Lord, for your continued presence in our lives and that we can um, obey your word so that we can reflect your character. Help us in this study, particularly uh, in the difficulties that we've been facing, um, in our lack of understanding. And uh, we pray that um, as we continue through these studies, they will um, strengthen us and that these things we learn will help this movement as we come closer um, to the upper room. We ask for your help. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, what was the particular point, uh, if anybody remembers, that we ended on yesterday that we were discussing? Does anybody remember? So I, I brought up a question near the end right there. Why do you remember? I'm trying to recall it. Okay, so it had to do with the 70. Does that help? So we got 70 uh, pieces of silver, 70 uh, people that are hired, and they're going to kill uh, 70 of the 70 sons. Of course, they're going to fail with the, with the youngest there, Joseph. So why would that, why would that be chosen to be overlooked? Um, what do you mean chosen to be overlooked by us? No. <laughs> or what do you mean jo chosen to be overlooked by who? By the whoever was recording this. Because obviously Jotham was not killed. Yeah. Oh, the, so the question, well, we, uh, we addressed that yesterday. Why do they say 70 are killed? Yeah. Well, because that's just the Hebrew way of saying things. They were to kill 70. And then they say one of them was not killed. Jotham wasn't killed. So they exclude him. But they're always going to talk about um, the one that's not, like, like they're always going to include it as 70, even though one of them wasn't killed. And yet, yeah, yeah, we, also, we, we also can see that here, here is his eldest brother, Jether. Who yeah. would not raise his sword, who would not take up his sword, he would not join in the battle. Mm -hmm. And yet Jether was slain yeah. by that son of a strange woman. Yeah, well, technically by one of the 70 people hired, but because uh, these would be hired assassins. So, um, and, and some details here that we're not really quite sure of uh, because it says they're going to be slain upon one stone. And notwithstanding yet, Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he had hid himself, it says in verse 5. So, so we're not even really sure what this upon one stone means. What is this really referencing? 
why why do we have this here and and is this some kind of symbol that we have to take into account <laughs> yes it'd be some kind of a symbol but how do we account for it mm -hmm. right and and we already said that well that this youngest and the eldest in 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 chapter eight um are going to remind us of uh the curse to rebuild Jericho. And that we know that a lot of the symbols here are addressing um, addressing that point, right? So they're addressing the, the seven times, uh, the idea of Shechem dealing with the Mount of Blessing and the Mount of Curses. Uh, we have, um, of course, uh, Jotham is gonna be speaking from Mount Gerizim when he, he says his parable. And um, and then we have, of course, the, we have this one of the 70, the 70th week being symbolized as well. And now, but of course, the 70 represent the 70 weeks, right? And so, and they're going to be slain upon one stone. And, and I can think of, you know, the stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Um, so there are some symbols that we can tie to uh, the 70 weeks. And to the 2520. Hey, Theodore, I have a question. Maybe I missed this, but, um, you know, where does it say that 70 people were hired by those 70 pieces of silver? Um, well, it's just sort of implied because he's going to hire these, uh, these men, right, to do this. So, so the implication would be that, that it would be one piece of silver for one person. I mean, because the idea is that he's going to hire these men to do this. Um, if you're going to kill 70 people, I mean, you can't go there with just, uh, you know, a few people. Now, I mean, it is possible he could have hired more than 70, but um, uh, so when he gives in verse four, he gave him three score and 10 pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bareth with, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. Um, it's just assumed on my part, at least, that, that there would be 70 people hired but yeah, you know, it's it's not it's not plainly stated. It just would be implied. Okay, I was I was just wondering where you come up with uh, the seventy people because yeah, it doesn't say so specifically. Yeah, yeah. So that that's just how how I do that. I mean, it's I mean, it is possible that it's not, but I, I don't understand why particularly seventy pieces of silver. Um. But yeah, I mean, I could be wrong there. It just, it just seems logical to me, but. We at least have the 70 pieces of silver and the 70 uh, sons of, of Gideon. And we still have one that's left out of that 70. So there isn't 71 sons of Gideon. Right. Some some people think that there is. There must be 70, well, 72 altogether is how they count it, because they count the Dimlik as one, the 70 that are slain, and then the one that isn't slain. But um So where we had this. Is it chapter nine? Um, and the other point that, that we uh, sort of found when we were reading the spirit of prophecy had to do with this. Um, Is here I'm trying to find something 
So, um, yeah, it's at chapter eight. Okay, so one of the things about this concubine that he had, the we were, um, Ellen White says that this is a strange uh, woman, that is, she is a foreigner. And, and she seemed to have been uh, quoting, so if I can find this again. And that was August 4th, 1881. So she's going to, um, the son of a strange woman, right? Which she has in quotes. Um, besides these, besides the 70 sons, uh, there was another, Abimelech, the son of a strange woman. This person had no right to the inheritance with Gideon's lawful children. So, so the son of a strange woman, um, where would that come from? Because I don't see it here. Maybe I'll just look it up. Uh, it's not the right place. Okay, that's going to be Judges chapter 11, verse 2. Um, but this, she's quoting, uh, let me see, Gilead's wife, and his sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said, so she's actually quoting another passage that isn't talking about um, Abimelech or his mother. So, but she uses that phrase, and that's kind of what I thought. She used it from somewhere else. Um, but Ellen White's saying, even though it doesn't say here in the Bible that this concubine is a foreigner, Ellen White says that this concubine is a foreigner. So what do we make of that? Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to read this. <clears throat> and you're saying that this says that this is the, that this woman is a foreigner. Because the, the paragraph reads, according to the evil custom of those days, Gideon had taken numerous wives, and his death he left no less than 70 sons. Yeah. Beside these, there was another Abimelech. Then the quote, the son of a strange woman, which yeah. you point out correctly, it's from Judges 11. Yeah. This person had no right in the inheritance with Gideon's lawful children. So how do we apply this as being of a foreigner? Because that's what a strange woman means. Strange just means foreigner, foreign woman. So the portion that you're looking at there, that would be, if I'm using the Strong's numbers, Hebrew 3.12. Yeah, so in Judges 11.2, um, yeah, 3.12. So if we're looking at that, as we would be led to by Father Miller. Mm -hmm. um, that word, as we're looking at it. Yeah, the only time it's translated as strange is in Judges 11 too. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that because the first mention of our first use of that word is in Genesis 4.25. Yeah. yeah. And in that, it's just saying, um, using that word in the sense of, uh, 
another, right? Right. It's going to be another seed. So in this case, the word strange is not the one that's usually translated like strange wives. That's another word. Yeah, because that, that word has been used so many places as, you know, almost like additional. When, yeah. we're, look, when we're looking at things like Genesis 29, 30 and Genesis 30, 24. Yeah. So you're, you're saying that Ellen White could be using it in the sense of um, there was another Abimelech, the son of another woman. Well, but, you know, Ellen White's putting it in quotes. She's not telling us what, what verse that she's using, but she is using this phrase from um, uh, uh, Judges 11. Now, in the context there in Judges 11, even though this word does usually mean another, um, Um, because in the context, this is the idea that this is a foreign woman. Well, the the verse there, Judges eleven one, yeah, it is referencing to Jephthah the Gileadite. Yeah, and it says that he was the son of an harlot. Yeah, and when we did that study in Judges eleven, yeah, the the question that we were asking was it possible for harlots to exist of the children of Israel. Yeah, it, it was, but Ellen White clearly pointed out that, that, that she was not an Israelite, if you remember. The right? mother of Jephthah or? The mother of Jephthah. Okay. Right. And, and this is along the border there. So when we read that story, we had this discussion and, and Ellen, Ellen White clearly marked that she was not an Israelite. Okay. That's what I remember. <clears throat> so in Ellen White's view, this would be a foreign woman and she would then be using this phrase uh, in quoting this phrase. That's what she would understand. Um, that it's not just that she's a harlot, but she's also not an Israelite. So. <clears throat> now, I mean, the point here, of course, has to do with, with what this is talking about symbolically. So it is an important point, right? Because we're saying that Abimelech, is the result of uh, not just something illegitimate, but also something that is uh, not according to Willer Miller's rules, the message of Abimelech, right? Right, so that was, that was, you know, basically that would fit in that she's not an Israelite, um, just as it did in the, in the story of Jephthah. Okay. So, with this example, are we seeing two sides of the same coin? Okay. What do you mean? Well, we have one. We have a Bimelech who is, as Ellen, as Ellen White is pointing out, the son of a strange woman. We also have Jephthah who the Bible points out is the son of a strange woman. Mm -hmm. One is, one seeks to lead Israel by deceit. 
the other is sought by Israel to lead them. Now, as, as we look at this in comparing different verses and in trying to address what we're seeing, we have the son of, quote, another woman, which may well be a foreigner. Mm -hmm. So this is a message then where Abimelech is concerned, a message that we should not accept because it is a message from outside of God's word. Mm -hmm. Would that make sense? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the way that I understand this. So I think the significance here is um, in, in taking this message of Abimelech, um, we're saying that this Abimelech's conspiracy, as, as you know, the heading there calls it, and, and it is a conspiracy in the sense that he conspires to kill the 70 sons, right? That's the idea there, right? And then to take over this, uh, as the leader of God's people, right? So he wants to, he wants to rule where the sons of Gideon are not doing that, right? So, I mean, the whole thing's all uh, a manipulation of the men of Shechem. But if we're looking at this as a message, it's not just, it's not just a manipulation of the men of Shechem, the men of Shechem, I mean, the house of his mother and of his mother's father yeah. go along with this. Mm -hmm. They accept what he is saying. Yep. Now, the type of message is not one that that we as a movement are to be giving it's a but it's a message that gets accepted and leads others astray mm -hmm. would that be fair yes and 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 the message of course has to do with because the ones that are killed represent the 70 weeks and the one week is the one that survives. Right? You okay. understand what I'm saying? Because when it comes to the issues of, of addressing what's, of not being deceived in this movement, let's put it that way. God has given us chronology. But we can see also chronology can be misused, right? Agreed. And, and and we saw that with Odilio and, and Colin, that they, they, they're using chronology and, and they're using it correctly for the most part. Wrong is the application. But we were also given at the same time an understanding, and, and this was given us before, was the understanding of the week of Christ, the 70th week. And just as we were um, addressing of these issues just as we are coming to the end of our of our 777 days we started to look at this in a bit more detail and i can't remember what date it was that i i first recognized i, I could probably look through my emails or something like that to find when i first had the april 5th 2030 date and started uh examining that Look it up. Um, but this really becomes an answer to what's being done, right? Um, uh, 
right? We, we start to understand that God has given us more time. Now, um, so back in 2018, I mean, I noticed this, but let's see, or 2019, I guess. Um, let's see. Um, now, and, you know, like I noticed the April 5th, 2030, but when Odilio does his presentation on February 12th, um, I send him an email, which I also send, and I'll just send it to him. Uh, so I say this is from an email I sent to Stephen Dwight in Iran. I had not sent to you. So, so I'd sent it to, to um, uh, earlier. So I'm not sure when I sent it earlier, but I'm going to present to him this argument for uh, April 5th, 2030 from the week of Christ study. So we had been looking at that in the context of, um, because we were doing this study, so I'm just gonna, I know you can't see what I'm doing, but this is my email. Uh, so that's gonna be, I hope it doesn't show up. When I first sent this, maybe I, I'm just gonna put this number in. Because we, we were studying, um, this study early on. So that would have been uh, when we were studying through Abraham. For some reason it doesn't show up here. Uh, I'm just going to just do this by itself. Okay, so February, it's going to be February 9th. Okay, so on February 9th of this year, was when we had done, just before that, we had done the study dealing with the, um, by taking Genesis chapter 12, 15, 17, and 22, and coming up with this 67,302 number, which is 187 prophetic years, right? So if we remember that. So anyway, then we went, I started looking back at the week of Christ study. Um, so God gave us in answer to Colin's study and also just before Odilio did his study, he gives us this information that's going to allow us to recognize that there is, there is something in the future that we have to pay attention to as a date, right? April 5th, 2030. And, and that, of course, was, I, I first noticed it in 2018 in the week of Christ study, but I didn't pay any attention to it, right? I just knew that the week of Christ pointed back to the first day of the first month uh, in 2030 um, by taking what we were doing with the years the year for a day. So, um, so if, if we're going to look at this message of Abimelech, uh, we can see that it has to do with the misuse of chronology, uh, but it's also an attack upon the foundation of the message. And maybe that's partly why it says they're going to slay them upon one stone. Would that one stone be the foundation stone? What are you seeing as the foundation stone? 2520? Well, the week of Christ, the cross, Christ crucified, right? I mean, it's related to the 2520 because Christ 2520 in the midst of the week. But but this is an attack of Christ. This is a crucifying of the son of God afresh. This is a rejection of the stone, which the builders, you know, the builders rejected, right? The stone, the builders rejected. And, and so, you know, part of what I see in this whole study, everything that, 
you know, like right now I'm doing a study on the, the feast of, of weeks and, and the feast of first fruits and the timing of those um, dealing with the manna and so forth. And all of these things point to Christ's work. You know, the manna being Christ is the bread that came down from heaven. And, and, and also the fact that we have this alignment of these days, the, the 14th being a Friday, the 15th being a Sabbath, and the 16th being a Sunday, both when the manna is first given and when the manna ends, but also when Christ is crucified, right? So in, in the literal week of Christ, you know, in that week when Christ is crucified, I mean, he's crucified on a Friday, resurrected on a Sunday, and this aligns with, you know, the first Passover that after they cross the Jordan River. So there, there's just so many things that, that, that bring all of these things together that show that when you reject and when you misuse scripture, but when you reject the foundation of this message, um, you go off into error. It's an extremely dangerous thing. Adventism has done it. And this movement has done it, I mean, in various ways. So it's not a matter of just that Colin and Odilio um, made a misapplication of chronology, that if that is not corrected, it becomes a much more serious error because it becomes a rejection of Christ. But isn't this pattern something that we see occurring throughout the situation with the children of Israel over and over again? Well, yeah, that's right, which is what we have to be careful about. We have to recognize why we were given this chronology. I mean, there are some in the movement who don't really accept the chronology. I mean, it was stated to me in one study and then, um, and then I talked to the people on the phone afterwards, and they basically held the same view, is that I was doing the same thing that Tabo was doing and Parminder doing with the lines, holding them over us like we have to, you know, follow these lines. And, and their argument was, you know, this is all about the third angel's message. And, you know, chronology is not basically that important, you know, um, that we, you know, we can't just look at chronology, we have to look at the third angel's message. And of course, there's nothing in what I've ever done that has rejected the idea of looking at the third angel's message. I just recognize that the third angel's message is connected to chronology. And that if you're going to understand the third angel's message correctly, you have to understand the chronology correctly. I mean, this is true of the first coming of Christ. Can we know that Christ is the Messiah without understanding chronology? There's many people who claim to be the Messiah. But Christ comes at the right time. Can we have Millerite history without an understanding of chronology? Can we have prophecy, really, without an understanding of chronology? God has given us chronology. Line upon line is part of that. Right, because it's to set in order upon a line the way marks right from here to here, these events, which are chronological events. That's what this whole movement is founded upon. And and that can be misused, right? So there's some who just out and out reject any sort of use of symbolic time. That's the December 6, 2020 declaration. You know, we can't have dates be symbols. This was all. We were all misguided in that sense. But we can't have people who use dates, but use them in a way that we, we, we've been shown that we can't use them. So when we studied early writings, page 74, and we saw the parallel with this movement, that is, the parallel was quite simple. There were people who accepted October 22nd, 1844 as valid, yet they continued to set time. 
and they set a date in November of 1851. And I assume it's because they still believe that the Jewish year always started one year later than the rabbinic Jews. Otherwise, they would have put it in October. But that's another point. But Ellen White says that we can't set time, right? But that's what she says in page 74 of early writings, that they were wrong in setting a, a date for the second coming of Christ. We don't have a message based upon time. Now, she wasn't saying that chronology was wrong, right? She was, she was saying that people were misusing time in the sense of we cannot know the set date for the second coming of Christ. So now we have people who, we have people who reject July 18th, but we have people who accept July 18th, but they are doing the same thing as those people were doing in 1850 and 51 in setting a date for the second coming. So when we try to predict events, we've rejected the foundation of the message because we've rejected the light that came from how God had led us. And if we reject that light, we're in danger. That's where this movement is right now. Now, not everybody has heard that light. Not everybody knows about how these lines uh, work and how God has shown us um, what July 18 means because they haven't been given the opportunity, many of them. So, so I think, you know, this fits perfectly with the situation presently. So the symbols here, the stone, the three score and 10 persons, the three score and 10 pieces of silver, uh, Shechem. And then as we get into uh, Jotham's uh, parable, all of these things are going to address um, not just the apostasy that has occurred now, but the apostasies that has occurred in the past within this movement. And we're going to basically be given four generations, if we want to put it that way, uh, being illustrated in Jotham's parable. Any other thoughts on the, that? So. Looking at a couple of things, but I haven't developed a thought yet. Okay. Well, what things are you looking at? What points are you? Well, as you're as you're looking at this, or as as we have been looking at this from Judges nine one through nine six. Okay. When we get to 9-6, we have <clears throat> the verse reading, and all the men of Shechem gathered together and all the house of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar that was in Shechem. Yeah. <clears throat> now, this gives reference back to Joshua 24. Yeah. Because as that reads in Joshua 24, 25, 26, and 27, so Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak, which was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us for it hath heard all the words of the Lord, which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. Mm -hmm. Now, when we are adding this with Shechem, we have the sons of Israel tending their flocks by Shechem. We have Shechem as being the son, <clears throat> the son of one. That wasn't wasn't his name Shechem, the one that defiled Dinah. I'm 
No. Jacob's daughter? I don't know. I, I don't. Okay, what's all that noise? It... Well, my dog is okay. interested in something, so I'm, I apologize. Yeah. yeah. So at this point, with this, we have, if I, if we turn back to that for just a second, um, okay, Shechem. Okay, and Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him in Judges 34, 6. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. The men were grieved and they were very wroth because he was, had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter. Yeah, so Genesis 34, 6. Correct. Judges. Okay. So... <clears throat> Shechem has several points that are being tied to this with the, the children of Israel, right? Yeah. Shechem, the son of Hamor, defiles Dinah. Mm -hmm. Shechem <clears throat> defiles the woman Dinah the representation of the church, the daughter of Jacob. So we're dealing that Shechem at this point <clears throat> could be a representation of a message that we should not be accepting. Would that be a, a fair comment? Yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I don't, I don't quite, I don't, I don't really follow um, how this Shechem here connects with the other Shechem. I mean, it's the same, same name, same word, but I don't see the relationship of these stories. Isn't it the, <clears throat> isn't the Shechem where Jacob pitched his tent, also the same Shechem that we're, we're talking about as far as the area? Yeah, but I'm just saying this story of Dinah, I don't see how this connects thematically in any way with what we're talking about. Like, it's not the same story. We have a people that are living here in Shechem, which you pointed out yesterday mm -hmm. was between Gerizim and Ebal. Yeah. We have a situation where we have a group that is living between Gerizim and Ebal. They are living between the blessings and the curses yet they are more willing to be blessed, or excuse me, they are more willing to be cursed than blessed because they're willing to accept a false leader. Right, so I understand that. But then you go to the story of Dinah. <clears throat> I don't see the parallel there. Just, we have the name, right? But we don't have, I don't see anything else there. Was the situation with the son of Hamor a blessing or a curse on the children of Israel? Well, I mean, it's a curse, but I don't know. I just don't see why we would go to that story. I mean, other than that, there's the name Shechem there. But that just, the, the story is not the same story. Like, I, 
because I think there's other things we have to look at first. I mean, if we go to, to the story of the covenant, then we have something that I can see. So we, we know that this is the oak that's set up. It's also called uh, the pillar, right? Or, or the plane. It's even referred to as the plane, right? In the one place, you, it, it says the plane of Shechem, but it's actually the same word for oak, right? Okay. Right? Because you could. Um, but this this pillar could, I think we, we were addressing this in the initial studies. Was this pillar not set up near the oak where Jacob got rid of the idols of his house? Yes. Right. So, so yeah. And so that all ties together. And, and even when we go to, to Judges chapter 9, um, and it talks, or in Joshua here, Judges chapter nine, um, and we have these three score, score, score and ten persons that they slay these seventy upon one stone. I mean, it doesn't tell us what this stone is, um, but you know, we have a stone in the story, right? So that we have a stone that becomes a symbol. And, and the stone exists in this story. Um, so here I can see the whole rejection of, of like everything's tied together in the story as far as I can see. I don't see that in the story of Dinah. There's, that's, that's a different story, like in the sense of what's being symbolized in that whole story, right? But in this story, if we take Joshua, one is we see the covenant, right? And we know that this, this is about the covenant week, is it not? He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. I so, think there is an application, yes. Yeah, so in the story of Jotham here, being the 70th week, being this week of Christ, um, this would relate to the covenant. And, and that's what we see in in Joshua chapter 24 is this covenant, right? Which is made in Shechem. Right, so we, so we can tie this, these men of Shechem together with that story that happened in, in Joshua chapter 24. But, I mean, maybe there's some way that we could tie, you know, the story of Dinah there. But I don't, I don't see it. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying you're wrong. But, you know, just because we can see the name Shechem doesn't mean that we have to see the same story. I mean, there could be something else involved there. But it, unless you could sort of tie it together with the covenant you know, maybe I don't understand the story of Dinah enough. Okay, now, part of the other, the other part of what I was looking at with this, mm -hmm. again, looking at <clears throat> Signs of the Times, August 4th of 1881. Mm -hmm. Abimelech was successful in his schemes and was accepted at first by the Shechemites and afterward by the people generally as the ruler of Israel. But while thus exalted to the highest position in the gift of the nation, he was utterly unworthy of the trust. Now this is paragraph nine. Yeah. His birth was ignoble, his character was vicious. The higher and noble qual nobler qualities, virtue, integrity, and truth he had never cherished. He possessed a strong will and indomitable <clears throat> perseverance. And thus by the most unscrupulous measures, he accomplished his purposes. The next two paragraphs are very telling about the people, not just Abimelech. I'm gonna read these two because that noise in the background is driving me crazy. So I'm just gonna mute you. There. And um, so, so we'll read these here. 
The Israelites, blinded by their own sinful course of apostasy, were acting directly contrary to God's express commands, and he left them to reap the results of their own folly. It was not God's will that Israel should have a king, but in case they desired to be thus governed, the Lord, understanding the pride and perversity of the human heart, had reserved to himself the right to appoint a king over them. God had brought Israel out from Egypt to be a peculiar people, especially devoted to himself. And unlike any other people, Israel's great ambition to imitate the idolatrous nations around them was the result of separation from God. Pride and ambition similar to that which cursed ancient Israel exists in the church of God today. They're unwilling to be a peculiar people, distinct and separate from the world. To reach the Bible, Bible standard requires self-denial, a crucifixion of the affections and lusts. The unsanctified heart reaches out for forbidden things, but these very objects of desire will prove now, as anciently, a source of weakness and corruption. Christ gave himself for us that he might cleanse us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Those who seek the honor which comes from men are ever ready to adopt the customs and practices of the world. They gain their position by the exercise of traits of character, which should lie dormant. If only those were exalted who had gained their position by fidelity to God and man, the standard of morality and religion among the people would be elevated. The sin of which we are guilty in acting contrary to God's expressed will is much greater than that of ancient Israel, as our light and privileges have been greater than theirs. Okay, so thoughts on that, Dwight? Or anyone? I mean, the danger that, that I'm not sure if Dwight's there or not, but um, the danger that results uh, from pride and ambition, and that this comes from uh, a connection to the world, right? So worldly policy, right? That's, that would be a huge problem that we would see. So how has this been manifested in us, what is our sin particularly? Why, why does division occur in this movement? Is it because we're all being uh, very particular about uh, what we believe and we're standing up against error? Or does this have to do more with, with pride? It has to do more with pride. And, and we know that that's the case because if we were not controlled by pride, we would treat our brethren differently when they're in error, right? Exactly. We would be much more, um, much kinder. And especially we wouldn't be talking about people um, in the way that we have. We would be addressing the points. We would be discussing the issues and, and doing it in a way that's Christ-like, open, uh, not talking about people behind their back and uh, maligning their character. We would be addressing the issues themselves from God's word, and we would do it as a Christian. But that's not not how we have dealt with the differences that exist within this movement. And um, so, you know, one of the things, and, and this is sort of a bit of an aside, but one of the problems that, that has existed within Adventism, um, within conservative Adventism, in the issue of Trump, and, and the issue of this movement as well. So many of us sided with 
Jeff against Parminder and Tess for one simple reason. We're conservatives, right? So when the issue of CNN and Fox came up, there was a large group in this movement who sympathized politically with the right and not with, with the left. Now, the younger people tended to be more likely to side with the left. That is, they're not really truly conservatives. And that's usually typical of young people. You become more conservative as you get older. Until you die, then you vote uh, Democrat. But um, so, so the problem that, that exists with many of us is that even though we talk about Trump, you know, wanting him to become president from a prophetic point of view and that he's going to bring in the Sunday law. Actually, I find that there's a strong sentiment in favor of Trump within the movement. That is, we would agree with Trump in what he says and what he has done. And, and the desire to have Trump coming back into power, even though on the one side we believe he's going to bring in the Sunday law, there is... There is the sympathy with Trump's position. We hate what we see happening in this world. And, and I find this a really strange sort of um, situation. It's, it's almost like an oxymoron in the sense that why would, we, why would we sympathize with Trump yet believe that he's going to bring in the Sunday law? Does that make sense what I'm saying? in the position that I've had for a long time. Yeah, so, so we have this pride and ambition, but, it, but it's just that we think like the world. Yeah, William, you have a point? Yeah, I was just gonna say, because they, they, more, they want, they more in this world than they are in the heavenly world. Yeah, we become political. You know, and, and I understand it. I mean, when it comes to looking at some of, you know, I mean, I would be a con considered a conservative, um, you know, so I would more, if I was political, I would lean more towards the, some of the ideas that we would see in the conservative ranks. Of course, I'm also a, a classical liberal um, in the sense that uh, um, I don't believe that we can control people, that people need to be allowed the freedom uh, to act as they see fit, because God gives all of us the freedom to act as we see fit, as long as, you know, where, you know, where there is the civil rights, I mean, the civil law, I mean, you're not going to allow people to just to murder whoever they want or whatever. But, but as far as people's own choices, God gives us the freedom for our own choices, and he allows us to see the consequences of those. So a Christian who thinks that, that we're so, somehow going to take up the role of God and control other people uh, is making a mistake. The Christian's weapon, so to speak, is not the state, but the gospel. And so as a Christian, I've never been political. I've never believed that, you know, when there's a political party I don't like and they're doing things I don't like that I should now become politically active and, and seek to change the world uh, through voting. I don't vote because I don't believe that that is going to make our world a better place. So, but yet I think that many people within Adventism, conservative Adventism and within this movement are political. And, and they're not just political in the sense that, you know, they vote, but they're political in how they deal with their brethren, in how they act and behave. They've modeled themselves after the world. And, and we saw this with Parminder. We saw this with Tavo, um, where they would, they would have an agenda and they would work behind the scenes to bring about what they thought should happen. As a Christian... We have to trust that God is going to take care of these situations that we have no control over. We don't seek to control other people. And, and so this spirit of Abimelech 
is is really pride and ambition. It's the idea that we can control others. Now, um, so let's let's deal with another point. Um, when it comes to why why are we interested in truth? What would be our reason in interest being interested in the truths of God's word? Why do we want to know what is true? Why do you want to know what is true? Anyone? Because, I mean, supposedly we're all interested in truth, right? But for what reason? Have you ever thought about that? Isn't there a desire to understand what God is trying to say to us? Okay. But the question is why? And, and so let's look at it this way. Um, there are people who aren't interested in the truth. That is, they rather live under a delusion. Now, why is that? I mean, it's not logical. So, for instance, let's say I'm going to make a decision. Um, and I have really bad information. You know, let's say, let's say, we'll use an example, like I'm, I'm going to get involved in, uh, um, what do you call that, like Bitcoin or something like that. And so be, before I decide to invest in Bitcoin, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go onto the internet and find all of the sites that support the idea I should buy Bitcoin. And any site that, that is negative about Bitcoin, I'm going to dismiss. Would that be a wise thing to do? No, it will not. What's that? What, William? I said it wouldn't be a wise thing to do that. To just ignore all the ones that... that um, that speak negatively about Bitcoin and only listen to the sites that speak positively. It'd be uh, it'd be wrong to it'd be wrong to not go look at it and to see what the issues is. Right, right. So we would want to make a decision. I'm not saying we should buy Bitcoin or anything, or shouldn't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't really know much about it. But but there are people who are going to only find information that supports the decision that they want to make. And that's not really a wise way of going about things. I would want to know the other side of the story if I'm going to make a decision about something. So I would want to know what the facts are. It's like going to the Bible and with your own ideas, and that's all you want to see is your own idea. Yeah. So you're going to pick the verses that appear to support what you're saying. And any verse that doesn't appear to point what you're saying, you're either going to uh, ignore it, dismiss it for some reason, um, or you're going to make it, you're going to twist it to conform to your view, right? And, and that's not very objective. It's not very wise. And yet we see that um, most people operate in this way. Because most people aren't interested in truth. But the question is why? So one is we want to do what we want to do. It's not very logical. Now, now there are people who do want to know truth for wrong reasons and for right reasons. That is people who, who appear interested in truth. But I would say the primary reason we would want to know truth is we would want to have de make decisions based upon reality. That would be the re reason to know what is true. Because I would want to make a decision that, that is based upon correct information. I wouldn't want to have it based upon false information. If I'm going backpacking, um, you know, I'm not going to use some... Uh, and I want to know about a trail, 
I'm going to use the most accurate information I can to decide about that trip. I'm not going to go blindly, at least I don't. I don't go blindly backpacking unless I was backpacking with my friend Sheldon, who always planned bad trips. But, um, but if I'm going to go backpacking, I'm going to look at the trail. I'm going to find out what the dangers are. I'm going to look at what the weather is for that trip. All these types of things. I'm going to plan ahead because I don't want to, I don't want to have any surprises. Right? I don't want to end up being in danger. I want to be able to complete the trip to make sure I'm in shape, got the right gear, all those types of things. And, and so when it comes to the journey that we're making in life, the journey to the celestial city, um, if, so, if somebody came along and told me, well, you know, this trail is wrong, you know, you need to go this way, take this shortcut, and you'll save a lot of time or something. I mean, unless I have a good reason to trust that person, I'm not going to do that. But what we have done, if you look at, and I'm thinking of the story, of course, of Pilgrim's Progress. I mean, he has a journey to make. There's going to be mistakes we make along the way. But God is there to correct us, correct? And, and if we're in this movement, it would be wise to look at all of the information that we have, to not be biased about what we're seeing. I, I would think that, you know, it's important to study all of these things, right? It's important to look at what Colin is saying, what Odilio is saying, what other people are saying, and to evaluate it based upon God's word. So the reason why we want to know what is true, why we're studying here right now, is we want to be able to, to know what is right because there is such a thing as reality, basically. But we know that there are people who aren't interested in reality. They rather hide in the darkness instead of going to the light instead of responding to the light because the light's going to re reveal to them their sins and so if you have people who aren't in interested in truth what will be evident to us what would be evident in ourselves that we're not following truth and evident in other people who aren't following truth what would we see what, what do we see when people reject light that we see here in this story of Abimelech? Are the men of Shechem deceived by Abimelech? Yes. Okay, so they're deceived. Now, is there any reason they should be deceived? If they had not been following their own hearts, they would not have been deceived. Right. Because he deceives them using their own ambition. Right? Agreed. Right. right. I mean, they could have, you know, taken a look at the situation and recognized that Gideon's sons had no intention to rule over them at all. Right? So he's saying, but they're going to. So you better make me king, somebody who's more sympathetic with you because you're my brethren. So they were deceived because really they were already worldly. They weren't Christ-like. If they had been Christ-like, they could not have been deceived. Would you agree with that? That is a logical point. So, you know, when it comes to this whole situation, we're, look, we're looking at this story and we're relating it to this movement. We need to really examine our own motives in why we do what we do. 
It's not, it, it's not an easy thing. But God has given us an objective measure by which we can examine things. And what is that objective measure? What has God given this movement right from the beginning to know that we are being led of God? Right. And, and we've come back to this many times, but when we go to Isaiah chapter 28, I mean, we know this is talking about our situation, correct? Agreed. And we know that this is line upon line, precept upon precept, to set in order, line upon line, to measure with a measuring line, to stretch out a line, and here a little and there a little, right? That to mark these points upon this measuring line that are time. And we also know that judgment will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. Plummet is these way marks. That's what righteousness is. And, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and water shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand. Right? So we know that there is a false covenant, a covenant with death, and that there is a covenant that God makes with us for life. Correct? Agreed. Right. In verse uh, 14 of Isaiah 28. Wherefore, hear the word of, of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people in Jerusalem. Why are they scornful? This, that, that is, they have scornful means derisive. Right. What does this mean? This scornfulness. Have we not seen scorn? In this movement, when we talk about our brothers behind their backs, are we not making a covenant with death? Yes. When we listen to gossip and rumors, when we attack people's characters, are we not making a covenant with death? Are we going to be able to stand then when the overflowing scourge passes through? The Sunday law that we profess to be getting ready for, are we going to be able to stand in that Sunday law if we have these types of characters? We know we can't. So what's the point of talking about a Sunday law that's coming when we're not even ready for it? And we haven't even done our work in warning the world of this coming Sunday law. We're actually doing nothing. Right? This movement is doing nothing right now. And yet we profess to be the priests. Right? And, and we think that gives us some kind of special status. But all it gives us is a responsibility. So we're just going to start looking here then at, at Jotham. Now, um, the name Jotham means Jehovah is perfect. So we say he represents the 70th week because he's the 70th son. He's the youngest. And he survives this attack against the foundation of the message. And these men of Shechem are going to gather together and all the house of Milo that went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing, 
and lifted up his voice and cried. So, so if this is Jehovah is perfect, and he's going to stand on the top of Mount Gerizim, what is and and he lifted up his voice and cried. What is this message? Is it not prophecy and a warning? Okay, and, and, and is it not the loud cry message, the midnight cry message? Well, it's given as a loud cry, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so here he has this message. This is a message from God from the 70 weeks, the 70th week. And, and it's going to rehearse. It's going to have us look back at history. Is this what the 70th week does? Yes. Okay. Because in our study of the 70th week, one of the things that we have is we have, it goes back to the time of Christ from his baptism to the stoning of Stephen. And, and it's going to give us the literal number of days and Underneath, on the bottom, I would write out the years going in reverse, lining up with this. <clears throat> and this would lead us to the first day of the first month, right? Which is April 5th, 2030. That's what the week of Christ study has given us. It's given us this date in the future. But this parable of Jotham isn't going to just talk about a date in the future. It's going to talk about the past. And so it's going to use this parable of the trees. So I don't know how far we will get in 10 minutes, but at least we can look at this. We're going to read it over. We're going to think about this, and we're going to come back with some ideas tomorrow morning. He says, the trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by they honor God and man and go be promoted over the trees? So they give this rhetorical uh, question as a response. So that's obviously they're not going to. The tree said to the fig tree, Come thou reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness and my fruit and go be promoted over the trees? And then said the trees unto the vine, come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, come, uh, or, or the vine said unto them, should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said all the trees unto the bramble, come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, if in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, therefore, if ye have done truly and sincerely in that ye have made Abimelech king, and if ye have dealt well with Jerubbabel, uh, Jerubbabel and his house and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, for my father fought for you and adventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. And ye have risen up against my father's house this day and have slain his sons, three score and ten persons, upon one stone, and have made Abimelech the son of his maidservant king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If ye then have dealt truly and sincerely with Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech. And let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo. And let fire come out from men, the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer, which is the well, and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. So, so we have this parable and we looked at it before. And we were taking the position 
at least tentatively, that this is referring to the past, to different events. Now, the fact that there is four, could we line this up with four generations? Would that be reasonable? That would likely be reasonable, yes. Okay. And in the fourth generation, we see that the trees get the bramble to reign over them. Something that can't provide a shadow. Now, let's just, uh, because we've got only a few minutes here. So let's just... Let's just try one application. Could we apply this to the four generations of Adventism? Could we take the olive as representing the first generation, the fig tree, the second generation, and the vine, the third generation? Now we know that in, in this, it's a progressive destruction of four. And so we would have to understand what the olive, the fig tree, and the vine represent that chooses not to rule over God's people. And then we'd have to decide what the bramble would represent as something that rules over God's people. So it would be something that happens in the fourth generation that uh, causes the shade to be removed, right? So, the, and, and all these other blessings to be removed. So there would have to be something about each generation that would be symbolized by the olive, the fig, and the vine, each of these, these generations. So this isn't talking about people per se. You know, the, the olive tree doesn't represent people and the fig tree doesn't rep represent some people. Um, and, and here, of course, in the story, you know, we're, we're, we're taking this story, whatever, however... Jotham is applying it. I don't think he's applying it as four generations, but, but maybe we could make an application to that time. I haven't thought about that. I'm just taking this story and saying, we can take this to our time and can we make this fit? Not can we make it fit in the past? Um, you know, the past in, in Jotham's time, you know, can we make it fit in our time? Does that seem reasonable to try to, to apply it first to our time? Or do we need to, do we need to see that, that this is literally, literally in some symbolic manner, but applied to the time before, that this would refer to different events that he's talking about? Because I, I don't think it is, but I am taking it to apply to events in our time or periods in our time. And any thoughts on that? Okay, how would the olive tree uh, relate to the period from, let's say, 1844 to 1888? If we're going to apply it, how we understand the four generations of Adventism. All of being a representation of the Holy Spirit of light. Yeah. And, and does it, does it, a can we relate this to the arrival of the third angel's message in October 22nd, 1844 in any way? I'd have to give that consideration. Because if we took um, Zechariah chapter four with the vision of the golden lampstand, we can put the olive trees here right and and we know that this is a message that applies to adventist history right the message of righteousness by faith 
that arrives October 22nd, 1844, right? The third angel's message arrives. Now here it's two olive trees, but but can we could we make that kind of a connection? <laughs> so if we made that connection to the first generation, you know, could we take the fig, fig tree and apply it to the second generation from 1888 to 1919? as representing something that's happening in that period of time. You know, maybe, maybe this, I mean, we're, we're gonna have to think about that. Maybe this is not how to apply it. Right. But I'm just saying, that could we apply it in that way the other way that we would have to apply it is we'd have to take it as applying to our history from uh 9 11 or or maybe even from 1989 maybe even to go back there and and try to apply this i think the application on the movement would be a little easier to make than the application with the history in general yeah yeah the only the reason why yeah so i understand what you're saying and i and i think that's true the only thing that i'm thinking here is um i mean we have a point in which trees have the bramble well, we could say that of course about adventism and and that there could be an application here to uh to that but but yeah uh, we're going to have to look at this then again tomorrow anyway, but I, I'm just proposing that we have to look at it some way. And, and that four generations seems to fit. Do we have four generations in this movement, I guess, then is the other question. I would say that we probably do. Yeah. So I don't think we've ever really defined them. So. Okay, but let's close with a word of prayer, and we'll pick this up tomorrow. A dear Father in heaven, we again are thankful for this study and for the things that we have found in your word. We ask that you can be with us throughout this day as we think about these things. Help us to take time in our personal study, and uh, we pray, Lord, that you can lead us tomorrow. Be with each person. May your angels watch over us today in all that we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.